Okay, hello everybody. So um, I'm from Airbus, so the head of the electric propulsion group. Uh, so I'm the commercial guy. The, the, <laughs> uh, so it's funny because when I am in Airbus, I'm in the engineering teams, and uh, I'm always seen as uh, too technical. So this time I will be uh, the, the commercial one. And, uh, and the purpose already of this presentation is to explain you uh, why we are using electric propulsion uh, in Airbus and why there is a, a big interest for our customers. Uh, if you want uh, to better understand our business, uh, you have to compare us as a car manufacturer, as a Seat or Mercedes or Renault or so on. We are really integrator, satellite integrator. Uh, so we do platforms uh, for satellites which will be uh, in orbit. And then we, we put on this platform some payloads. So where we will put the uh, commercial uh, Channels that uh, will allow you to, to look at uh, your Real Madrid match on the Yes. So, um, so the idea is really here uh, for you to understand why uh, electric propulsion is of interest. And to, to do that, uh, I will start very quickly on some key dates for electric propulsion to show you what is the evolution and to show you the acceleration that we had on this market uh, on, the, on the last uh, past years. Uh, and then I will come back to the uh, telecom market, just to explain what is this market, uh, what we are speaking about, and uh, what is the interest uh, of electric propulsion for such market. Then you will see, and I will try to take some time to explain you, when we have decided to switch to electric propulsion, what are the key trade-offs on which technology we, uh, we can choose to, uh, to offer the best offer to our customers. And uh, at the end you will see uh, a quick overview of uh, our platforms, how we uh, integrate electric propulsion to see some concrete sh things on electric propulsion. And if I have time, uh, so some next steps uh, for electric propulsion. Uh, concerning the electric propulsion history, uh, one quick chart. Uh, as mentioned by, uh, by Rosé, uh, it started quite a long time ago. It was uh, uh, 50, 15 years ago. We, 50 years ago, we were already uh, working on electric propulsion. But if we look at the introduction of electric propulsion in the commercial market, uh, in fact, the key dates are there. It's in the late uh, 90s uh, with the first targets uh, that uh, were shown by, uh, by Rosé, then the first uh, uh, gridded ion thrusters, and the first uh, uh, all effect thrusters, which were used for station keeping for the geostationary st satellites. And uh, so, in fact, it is quite young in terms of uh, business for, for us. And it's only uh, uh, 13 years that we have uh, electric propulsion uh, on, on our spacecraft. And here there is a big boost in the last uh, past years uh, by the use of electric propulsion for all electric satellites. And uh, it's where I will focus uh, my presentation uh, today. Uh, so the commercial market, um, uh, it <coughs> seems like this. So we are speaking about commercial market, so for the geostationary uh, spacecraft, uh, where they are the best <coughs> position to provide the, uh, the commercial uh, uh, business. There are plenty of operators. These are our customers. We don't sell any uh, TV channel to anybody. Uh, we sell our spacecraft to the operators, and then uh, they sell their uh, channels to uh, uh, CanalSat or things like that. Uh, so you can see there are 60 uh, operators over the world, which is quite a lot, with very specific needs. Uh, and uh, the market is around 20, 30 satellites per year on the geostationary uh, uh, market. Uh, and it is a business which is growing because uh, you are more and more uh, looking at the TV, internet files, uh, internet exchanges are also growing, so, so there is a constant trend. Uh, with some cyclic uh, demand, uh, because there are some fleet replacement uh, in orbit. So if we uh, look at uh, the impact on, uh, on the population, uh, here you have an overview of uh, the market share in between the different primes uh, for two types of satellites. The one using uh, electric population for station keeping, and the one using electric population for station keeping and transfer orbit. Uh, these figures have, have been compiled on the, on the last uh, 10 years. Uh, about 30% of the geostationary telecom satellites have electric propulsion on board. Okay. 
and mainly today it's satellites with uh, electric propulsion to perform station keeping. Okay. How we see uh, the trend is uh, there will still always remain some chemical satellites because there are some operators which will need uh, very fast uh, orbit raising and they don't need uh, to have uh, so much uh, payload on board. Uh, and then uh, there will be place for these uh, uh, satellites with uh, electric propulsion for station keeping on a big place for the satellites with uh, all electric uh, uh, propulsion. So today I will focus on this one. Uh, why on this one? Because it's more our success story. Uh, this one you see that uh, it's clearly the American who are on this market. Who are, uh, even if Airbus is uh, has a leadership position in, uh, in Europe, uh, here you have the, all the American primes uh, on this business. Uh, who are better than we are. Full electric satellites, here Airbus has a, a world leading uh, position, so we are speaking of very large satellites, and I will explain uh, uh, the interest of this. So it was just to give you an overview of what is the market, what is the market, and the, why we are uh, placing uh, electric propulsion. So I, I will have some illustration. Uh, so we speak about three types of satellites, the full chemical, uh, the hybrid satellites with uh, ke chemical, uh, electric, chemical propulsion for transfer and electric propulsion for station keeping, and then the full electrical satellites. Okay. Uh, so something I, I didn't say from start. If, if you have if you have questions, do not hesitate to raise the, the hand, and uh, you stop me at, at this moment. Okay. We we'll try to make it interactive if you if you want. Uh, what is key to understand uh, is that all these uh, trade-off for electric propulsion is closely linked with the offer from the launchers. So we are from Earth, we have to, we launch our spacecraft from Earth, the spacecraft are injected on the GTO uh, orbit, which is the optimal uh, injection orbit of uh, the launcher that we have today. So it is a, a low perigee on the apogee at the geostationary uh, altitude. Okay. There are three main space, three main launchers uh, providing the, the best performances for commercial application: Ariane 5, Sea Launch, and uh, Proton. It was at the beginning of uh, 2000 years. It was a six-ton uh, kilogram uh, launchers, and uh, oh. one launchers changed a lot of things. It's uh, the arrival of Falcon 9, the SpaceX uh, launcher, uh, with a, a five-ton class for this GTO orbit. So I will explain why it changed uh, already the, uh, all the trade-offs that we had on uh, electric propulsion. So if we keep the example of, um, of uh, Falcon, so we, the launcher will be able to, to place five ton in, uh, in GTO orbit. So when it is on this GTO orbit, uh, it's not the final orbit, so you have to, to do some, uh, some burst with chemical propulsion. Uh, so here you use big uh, thruster, able to, to trust with uh, 400 or the 60 uh, uh, newtons. Uh, the specific impulse is not so high, but uh, thanks to the high trust, very high trust, you, you will go in uh, one week, two weeks, in, uh, in fact three, three four bird bursts, you will arrive to the geo stationary orbit. So you correct, you increase the PRG and uh, you correct the inclination uh, to be in the, in the plane of uh, the equatorial plane. Uh, when you have done that, uh, you have already used more than two tons of chemical propellant just to raise the orbit. So among these five tons that were injected, you have two tons just with chemical propellant. Once you are on the geostationary orbit, you will deploy your solar rays, and then you will do your mission. So. Uh, during uh, 15 years, which is the typical duration for such a uh, spacecraft. Uh, so with chemical propulsion, we'll use small uh, thrusters of 10 newtons uh, with an ISP of uh, less than uh, 300 seconds. And here again, you will uh, have a consumption uh, around uh, 750 kilograms of propellant uh, to keep uh, the spacecraft on its orbit uh, during these 15 years. So what you see is that here, the remaining mass is uh, below uh, two, two tons for the spacecraft itself <coughs> and uh, for the platform and the payload. So it's really what we call the, the dry mass, uh, the useful mass where we will place 
uh, some transponders to have the exchanges with, uh, with the Earth. Okay. So that's uh, the picture with the, the chemical uh, satellites. If we go to the hybrid uh, satellites, uh, so we do exactly the same uh, transfer. So we have the same penalty in terms of uh, consumption for, for the transfer. But here we will do a part of the station keeping, uh, part of this uh, mass, with electric propulsion. So we will increase uh, the ISP. And uh, during 15 years, uh, this time we will use uh, electric propulsion with an ISP of uh, 1,500 seconds, which will allow to uh, reduce significantly the mass of propellant that we need uh, to fulfill the mission during uh, 15 years. Okay. So in this case, uh, so you still keep some uh, chemical propulsion because you have mm, uh, some uh, uh, emergency maneuvers or east-west maneuvers that you want to keep with the chemical propulsion, and then you, you do the most important uh, delta velocity that you have to correct, meaning corresponding to the correction of the inclination with electric propulsion. And here you, you have increased uh, your dry mass uh, by uh, more than 400 kilograms, which is huge for us because it allows us to put more transponders on, uh, on, the, on the platform. More transponders, it's more channel for, for the video or for internet or so. <laughs> if you switch to uh, full electric satellites, uh, so today we, have, we are exactly using the same uh, injection orbit, the GTU orbit. Uh, but this time we are deploying the solar rays on, the, on this uh, GTU orbit. And from this orbit, uh, we will uh, use electric propulsion to raise the orbit up to the geostationary orbit. So that's a long trip because uh, the thrust is much lower than the one we can have with uh, chemical propulsion. We are below the one Newton compared to the 460 Newton. So it takes, for the biggest uh, spacecraft, six months to reach the, the geostationary orbit. Okay. Uh, after we, once we are in geostationary orbit, we will do the 15 years, again with electric propulsion mainly. <coughs> and uh, if you do the computation, uh, the mass of propellant is really reduced compared to the other case. So you have a, a drag mass, which is a, uh, significantly increased, allowing us to, to put much more payload for our customers. So they, for the same spacecraft, they will be able to have uh, a lot of more services to be provided to, to their customers. Okay. <laughs> so if we put ourselves in, um, in, uh, in the shoes of, uh, of our customer, why would they uh, switch from there to there first, uh, from the chemical to the hybrid uh, satellites? What they have to add is um, an electric propulsion subsystem. So it is really a, a, an additional, which is uh, on top of all the platform, because uh, you still need the chemical propulsion. So it is a second uh, subsystem. So you have to pay a few million euros to have this uh, additional uh, hardware. But uh, in, in counterpart, uh, but you can typically add a, 10 transponders, knowing that each transponder is about 1.3 million euros of revenue per year. So uh, you see very quickly that you, you can uh, have something which is uh, amortized in terms of uh, financial uh, things. Or you can try to reduce a little bit uh, the mass saving. In place of increasing uh, the dry mass, you can reduce it for the same mission. And uh, you can, if you have a launcher with a, which has a cost per, uh, per kilo, you can reduce the cost. Uh, for, for, for the past 10 years, uh, clearly the, the, the operators choose this more this first um, option, using the additional capacity by uh, increasing the payload mass and increasing the business that they were able to do. Uh, meaning that it was uh, really oriented to the customer who had quite a, a lot of uh, satellites, a lot of revenues, because they had to put some million euros additional at the start of the program. Uh, so it was concerning more the big, uh, the big customers. Um, if we switch now to, to the interest of the, the, the full electric, so uh, if you look at the mass, you say, OK, it's obvious you have to go there. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, there is one. <laughs> very uh, large drawback is the uh, time of transfer. So you have to add some hardware also for the, for the uh, 
uh, electric propulsion because it's bigger thrusters and the, the hardware is uh, bigger and you will see it uh, later on. But the main drawback is that you take six months uh, before being in orbit. So for a customer, it means that during six months, uh, you have paid your launcher, you have paid a part of your spacecraft, and you have no revenue. So you have to wait uh, six months uh, before having the first revenue. So it's really a money that is, uh, is, is frozen uh, and uh, they are not uh, uh, using it. Uh, and uh, they, have, uh, they have a loss of revenue due to that. And uh, to, to give you an order of magnitude, we, are, we estimate that it is between 10, 20 million euros uh, of loss for them. Uh, and uh, naturally, what, what uh, counteracts this is here you have the possibility to increase uh, the number of transponders, so you can uh, up to uh, 30 more uh, transponders. Uh, so you remember the, the figure I gave you, uh, 1.3 million euros per transponder per year. Uh, multiplied by uh, 30, uh, you see that it's quite interesting uh, after, uh, after one, two years. And the other possibility is that you can change uh, your launcher, meaning that this spacecraft, um, it's here that uh, you have to do the link with the, the first uh, 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 chart with the, the different launchers, uh, you are able to, push, to put this spacecraft in um, uh, so here in the Falcon 9 uh, launcher, but it will be the same as uh, the same spacecraft in an Ariane 5 launcher with chemical propulsion. So it means that by switching to uh, electric propulsion with the same uh, mission, you are able to save uh, up to uh, 13 million euros in one shot on the launcher price. Uh, so that's very interesting because here you, have, you are addressing all the customers, uh, the big customers who have a lot of transponders, a lot of spacecraft, and they are able to increase their, their, their fleet. And you are also addressing the small customers who have some difficulties to, to finalize their budget, uh, and uh, they are very interested by a, a launcher cost which is reduced. Okay. Uh, so that's really the main uh, interest of uh, electric propulsion for, for our customers. Just an illustration, I was speaking about um, the Falcon um, 9 case, but uh, even on Ariane 5 you have the, the lower position, which is also a, a position which is of interest for electric propulsion. Uh, the illustration, I go directly to, to that. If you had two f full chemical satellites uh, on Ariane 5, few years ago, and it's a real satellite, Astra 5B is, uh, is one satellite uh, which is uh, flying now. Uh, it was a, uh, a platform with a, a payload of uh, 11 uh, kilowatts. You can replace it by a platform of more than 15 uh, kilowatts payload, so meaning that you have uh, significantly increased the, the, the power, so the transponder numbers uh, on this spacecraft. Same on the, on the lower uh, place in the Ariane 5 uh, launcher. You can uh, switch from one 5 kilowatt chemical thrusters to uh, uh, 11 kilowatt thrusters. And it is the, the first one who was flown uh, this year, uh, the it, uh, ITELSAT uh, 172B. Uh, so you see that you have uh, doubled the capacity of the satellite thanks to electric propulsion. So yeah, by this illustration, you see clearly the interest of electric propulsion uh, for our customers. Okay. Uh, that is really why we switched to, um, to electric propulsion. So if we now um, uh, look more in details on the, on the electric propulsion uh, technologies uh, that we are uh, selecting, so you, you had a presentation from uh, Rosé with, uh, on, the, on the different types of electric propulsion. Here, just a graph to illustrate. You have plenty uh, of uh, electric propulsion technologies. Uh, the main technology which are used are the Arcjet 1, HET 1, and the gridded ion thrusters. Uh, but you have plenty of others uh, which will come in the next years uh, or not. Uh, and here you have a graph showing each technology has uh, a range where uh, it's more efficient. And uh, the efficiency of the thruster is the good one. And, uh, and you have here the, the specific impulse. I will come back on that uh, later on. And the specific power, which is a key for us, it is uh, the number of watts you need per millinewton of thrust. <coughs> okay. Again, I will come back on that, and you will see the interest uh, of it. Um, 
So we, as a prime, we have to, to select the right technology which will provide the best uh, uh, efficiency for our platforms so that we can compete with the other uh, manufacturers and uh, propose the best solution as possible. So if we take uh, electric propulsion for transfer uh, and for the all electric uh, transfer, there were mainly two uh, technology which, are, which were available at the time of uh, the launch of this project, uh, the all effect thrusters and the gridded ion thrusters. You have seen plenty of other uh, technologies, but the maturity was uh, high enough only on these two, two ones to be able to convince uh, a customer to fly uh, such technologies. So I will try to, to go quickly on this one. Uh, I put some, uh, some <laughs> small equation because uh, <laughs> I want to just say you, you, two characteristics are keys for electric propulsion, the trust uh, and uh, the ISP, so the specific impulse. Specific impulse uh, yeah, really give you the, uh, what you will consume in terms of propellant. So the highest specific impulse, uh, the lowest uh, you will consume uh, some propellant. So when you have a large specific impulse, it's interesting in terms of uh, power consumption for a given uh, delta V, uh, delta velocity increment modification. One key thing in electric propulsion is the efficiency of the thrusters. Uh, these thrusters are using uh, power, so the P, uh, and the efficiency is um, uh, the, the trust multiplied by the ISP divided by the, the power. Here, it's a very good indicator if the power that we inject in the, in the thrusters is really used for our mission, or if it is dissipated in a thermal uh, dissipation. Uh, so it is a, a very important um, indicator of uh, the maturity and uh, the efficiency of, uh, of the thruster. ISP, if you take uh, both equations, you will see that it is proportional to the uh, velocity. So uh, the, if you exhaust uh, your, your gas very quickly and the, when you will increase the, the voltage, you will exhaust it uh, more quickly, you will increase the ISP. So more the voltage is, uh, the more the ISP will be. Okay. Uh, so I come back to these two technologies, the all effect thrusters and the gridded uh, thrusters. Uh, what we can see here, you have some, some uh, lines which are underlying uh, uh, similar uh, uh, efficiency. So we can see that for such technologies, the efficiency were quite similar uh, for thrusters with uh, similar uh, power range. Uh, then when we have to, to select uh, in between both technologies, uh, and I will take sometimes to, to explain this graph. Uh, we have to understand um, uh, how it works to, uh, to put these, thruster, these uh, satellites on the final orbit. So you have here the velocity increment that you have to correct with electric propulsion or with the propulsion in general uh, to reach the geostationary orbit. Uh, and here you have the electric transfer duration. So if you have no transfer duration, no electric transfer, you are using uh, only chemical uh, uh, thrusters, so it is the, the blue uh, curve, and uh, you will have to perform 1,800 uh, meters per second correction with the chemical propulsion. So it is the, the typical uh, uh, delta velocity increment that you have to do with a Falcon 9 uh, launcher. So here it's uh, the, the Oman transfer, you, you, you have to go to the, your rocket uh, uh, <coughs> formulas. Uh, and then when you will introduce electric uh, propulsion, so you will reduce the use of uh, the chemical propulsion, and you will increase the use of the um, electric propulsion for the delta velocity uh, uh, correction. In red, you have the sum of the delta V. Uh, you, you can see that we are increasing the, the total uh, velocity increment that we have to inject on, on the satellite because we are no more in uh, Oman transfer, so it's not uh, optimized at all in terms of, uh, uh, of flight dynamics. Uh, we are not pushing exactly at the apogee, so we are pushing all around uh, the orbit. So you see that you are losing efficiency uh, in the global uh, transfer. 
but you, you don't really care because you are using electric propulsion, and electric propulsion has a high ISP, so, so it's, it's not really a matter. Uh, so you see that you are increasing the, um, the electric propulsion delta V that you are collecting and decreasing the chemical propulsion delta V up to a stage where you can no more have used of uh, chemical propulsion and uh, the electric propulsion is doing the complete uh, trade-off and to complete the transfer. So, uh, why I show you this curve? Uh, it's mainly because there is the continuous curve and the dotted line curve. Uh, and here it's closely linked to the performance of the thrusters. The continuous curve has been uh, drawn with the thrusters with an ISP of uh, 1,800 seconds. And the dotted curves are for uh, an electric thruster with 3,000 3, seconds. If you come back to uh, uh, this previous graph, you see that uh, uh, if you have similar efficiency in, uh, in the two uh, technologies, for a given power, and the, and the power is, is frozen uh, by the payload that we have on the spacecraft, uh, if you increase the ISP, uh, you will decrease the, the thrust. Okay, so the trust on ISP are closely linked in all these trade-offs. So I come back to here. Uh, here, what you can see is that thanks to uh, the high ISP, you will save uh, some uh, propellant for a given delta V, but thanks to the high trust, when you reduce the ISP, you will be able to do more delta V velocity uh, correction uh, with electric propulsion. And you will exchange more delta V between the uh, electric propulsion and the chemical propulsion where the ISP is very low. So why I, I shown you the, I have shown to you this, uh, this curve is because we, we have then the, the next curve, which is not intuitive at all. Yeah, it gives the dry mass gain that you have for the payload. So uh, how many kilograms you will save for your payload as a function of the transfer duration and what is not intuitive is that for uh, a lower ISP, uh, you will have more mass gain, okay? Because you are doing more delta V with this uh, electric propulsion, okay? So here it's ready to, to show you an example. So to, to show what, what we are doing in, uh, in Airbus is to, to try to see at the system level what are all the key drivers and uh, what allow us to, to select one or another uh, technologies. And uh, if you look at this, so you have uh, the grid technologies which are uh, um, provided by um, very good companies, uh, L3Com, Kinetic, Ariane Group, uh, so two in Europe, which is uh, very good. Uh, you, are, you have the all effect thrusters uh, provided by the Russian, the, the French, the Safran, the, the, the American. Uh, except Boeing, we are still using the, uh, this technology. Uh, all the other manufacturers uh, have selected the all effect thrusters uh, technology for the transfer uh, of their spacecraft. And even Boeing uh, booked some uh, all effect thrusters to perform some transfer on some platforms. This is really to illustrate to you what, what we do uh, in our engineering is to, to try to see, to select uh, the good technology to, as a function of our constraints uh, for that. Uh, one major point that we can uh, uh, note here is uh, perhaps if there is one figure to, to remember is the 0.5 kilo uh, per day of transfer per kilogram that per kilowatt you are using for uh, um, for electric propulsion. Here it gives you uh, the mass uh, gain that you will have, so you can compute very quickly uh, what will be your, your mass gain by using electric propulsion. So if I have a, a, a transfer which is of uh, 100 days. I will give, I will uh, gain 50 kilograms uh, of uh, dry mass for my spacecraft for each uh, kilowatt that I am using uh, for electric propulsion. So today we are using up to more than uh, 10 kilowatts. So that means that I, I have a gain for 100 days of transfer of 500 uh, kilograms. So it's uh, a quick uh, way to, to define the saving associated to, um, uh, to the electric propulsion. This is important uh, for, two, I say for two reasons. The first one is to, to show to you the importance of the uh, 
the power that we can inject. So at prime level, our main objective <coughs> during the transfer phase is really to, to try to bring the maximum possible uh, power to the electric population, because each kilowatt that we will gain, uh, it will be uh, up to 50, kilo, 50 kilograms of gain. So it's very major for us. Uh, so we have to optimize the overall design of the spacecraft uh, to use all the, uh, the power that we have from the solar arrays to, to bring it to the electric propulsion. Uh, the, second, um, the second point, which is also very important, uh, is the transfer duration. So I, I have shown you that six months of transfer, it's uh, between 10 and 20 million euros uh, for our customers. Uh, so it's really a, a key driver today when we have a customer, he's telling us, okay, I will be able to have a maximum of transfer of 100 days or uh, 200 days, six months, uh, three months. Uh, so today they are not uh, keen to go above the, uh, the six months uh, duration, transfer duration. So that's why uh, with, a, with a given uh, transfer duration, uh, the technology choice is quite obvious. Okay. Uh, okay, that's, that was for, for the choice of um, of our technology. So if we see now uh, how we implement the technology on the, um, on the platform, uh, yeah, I've shown, uh, I will be already quick because I will focus on the, on the transfer, but here it is a, <laughs> a schematic of a, of a platform, so with the solar arrays uh, in this axis. Uh, and here it is a configuration for station keeping. When we do station keeping, the main correction that we have to do is the inclination correction. Inclination perturbation are linked uh, to, the, uh, to the sun, which is uh, pushing, in fact, the, the solar rays, if I do it very uh, uh, in a simplified way. Um, so, so what we have to compensate is, uh, is uh, a component in this direction. So that's why we have uh, the thruster which are there, and we, we want to have a, a force uh, in, in this direction. OK, in this direction. Uh, the problem is that with electric propulsion, we have a large plume, and you have seen uh, the different uh, images from, uh, from Rosé, and, uh, uh, and we can't put the, the thrusters uh, exactly in the direction uh, of the solar arrays because it would erode completely the solar arrays, and uh, if you erode the solar arrays, uh, you will do some uh, short circuits on the solar arrays, and uh, the payload will be, uh, will be off very quickly. So we need to tilt, uh, to tilt, tilt by a fact, by a of a counting angle of uh, about 45 degrees. And when we do that, uh, we, we are obliged to do uh, a combination of manoeuvre, maneuvers on the other uh, side of the spacecraft. So we need to put thrusters on both sides. Okay. And as we put, uh, we need at least one thrusters, and then we have a random on thrusters in case of failure of the thrusters. So it was to quickly explain the configuration for station keeping. Uh, for electric transfer, so the idea is to reuse the, the same thrusters uh, for uh, station keeping and the uh, transfer in order to save costs. Uh, so you, we use more, uh, uh, more processing units to, uh, to, to have more power for, for these thrusters. Uh, we use also uh, thrusters on, uh, on the minus Z uh, phase. And then we will use uh, deployable arms uh, in order to have all thrusters uh, uh, pushing in, uh, towards the same direction uh, during the transfer, so that we have an optimized transfer for electric propulsion. And then when we are uh, on station, we have the, the mechanism which allows to, to fire towards the center of mass uh, to correct the inclination. Okay. And here it's really the, the way to reduce at minimum the number of thrusters on the, the hardware that we have on the spacecraft. Because if you remember, we have to add uh, some additional hardware, and it's uh, naturally uh, more expensive for our customers. So, uh, so we have to reduce at maximum the number of hardware that we have on the platform. Um, so on the here the, the station keeping manoeuvre. So if we look at uh, how it looks like uh, on a platform and uh, the electric propulsion subsystem for for all electric platforms. Uh, so you have the. Uh, the tanks where you put uh, the xenon, where at uh, high pressure, as explained by, uh, by Rosé. Uh, so it's uh, quite big tanks, quite heavy, because you, you have uh, the xenon at a very high pressure, <coughs> up to uh, 180 bar. Uh, you have then uh, some pressure regulator, because you need to, uh, 
decrease the pressure to have the two bar at uh, the inlet of the thrusters. Uh, and we use usually bang bang or mechanical regulator for that. And then um, you have the thrusters uh, which are mounted uh, onto the arms. Um, so here in, uh, in our uh, configuration for Airbus, we, are, we have the, the possibility to, to, to use the uh, the Russian thrusters or the Safran thruster from, uh, from France. Uh, you have the electronics. So here again, we have two, two possibilities in terms of electronics, uh, one from uh, France and one from Belgium. And uh, all that is mounted on a deployable arm, allowing to have uh, uh, the flexibility for transfer and then the, uh, uh, the capacity to, to push towards the center of mass when we are on station. OK. And then we have some small electronics, for, like a uh, switching box. OK. Uh, that's to give you an overview of, uh, of the subsystem, so uh, on the different equipments that we have uh, on our platforms. If you want a nice picture, so here, here you have uh, uh, the, the satellite with the, 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 the arm deployed in a, a transfer uh, configuration. Okay. And here it's, uh, it's, here it's an image of uh, the, the, the one who has been launched this year, and uh, it took take uh, four months to go to the final orbit. The no, because at, at the time uh, it was the patent, the fifth thruster, and it was not authorized to, to show some pictures. No, it is patented, and uh, so there is no more issue. Uh, but yes, there is a fifth thruster. <laughs> but we have the capacity also to do hybrid uh, satellites. If we want, we can still uh, uh, keep the, the uh, liquid uh, Apogee engine uh, and to do hybrid transfer which is, if we look at the technical aspect, the, the optimum. But uh, it's interesting to remove the chemical propulsion because we have some cost saving, which are very inter interesting. Uh, so it's my, my two last uh, charts. Uh, so on Airbus, uh, we, we worked on uh, electric propulsion, so uh, on the first Eurostar 3000 platform. So uh, yeah, it's where we have already uh, 10 spacecraft in orbit in, uh, since uh, 2004. Uh, here it was to perform the station keeping, so it is uh, the one I have not presented in the presentation, but uh, it's the, the oldest uh, version. So we have uh, switched to the Eurostar 3000E for EOR, which is uh, electric orbit raising. Uh, so we are able to address payloads which are much more powerful, up to uh, 16 kilowatts. And for that, we need a bigger thruster up to uh, five kilowatt thrusters. And we, we just finished the first uh, EOR uh, two weeks ago. So we are now uh, in orbit with uh, the Delsat uh, spacecraft on the final orbit. And uh, we, we are developing the next generation uh, to have more, uh, uh, even more power at, uh, at, at uh, platform level. Uh, with all electric uh, use and uh, also lower cost because it's, as you have seen, there are plenty of manufacturers. It's a very competitive world and, uh, and we need uh, each year to, to decrease our prices. Uh, so from, from, this, uh, uh, from this commercial market uh, with uh, geostationary platforms, uh, we, we see now that, uh, so it's really driving the, the electric propulsion business, and it was uh, uh, key to have uh, some, uh, uh, some business behind these, uh, these thrusters. Uh, so there are some uh, exploration uh, mission, but they are uh, one every uh, <coughs> three, four years, so it's not really a, a sustainable business for, for electric propulsion. Yeah. Here with uh, the commercial market and zero sustainability platforms, it's clearly there that uh, we, we are able to um, to grow this business on, uh, for electric propulsion. But now that we are in a more mature phase on, on that, we saw uh, mainly two, two big evolutions for, for, for the next uh, generation of electric propulsion. So the first one, and, uh, which is uh, under development, is the use of electric propulsion for the constellation. Uh, so here we are speaking about uh, much smaller uh, thrusters because we are in uh, low orbits. It's uh, very small uh, platforms compared to uh, the one we have in a uh, geostationary orbit. Uh, so here we are developing new uh, uh, subsystem <coughs> uh, where the trade-offs will not be the same. That means that the trade-off I showed you uh, will be different for, for such uh, platforms. Uh, 
So here we will look at um, uh, simplified uh, operation on the mainly we will look at very lower prices compared to what the, the one we have for geostationary platform because we have up to uh, 900 uh, spacecraft so so we, we can't afford to have a system which are uh, of million of euros so the key uh, uh, challenge here is to to do electric propulsion uh, with a, a very low cost and uh, and the other uh, range uh, upper range so it was uh, shown in the in the chart from uh, rosé uh, like uh, the six lunar missions we, we see that there will be, uh, uh, in the coming years, uh, some midness for servicing in space. Uh, so to do uh, uh, like uh, refueling missions or taxi missions or bringing spacecraft and one, from one point to the others, or uh, exploration mission, uh, like uh, going to Mars or around the moon. And here we will need uh, much bigger thrusters because we will need a much big, bigger vehicle. And the, the key challenges here will be to to be able to increase um, this and uh, to be in time to market uh, compared to the American who has already uh, developed quite a lot of things uh, in this domain. Okay, and that's it for, for me. Thank you, Vincent, for this excellent presentation. Uh, questions from the audience? Okay, have one. <laughs> when you talk about uh, alternative propellants, uh, the main driver is the price of xenon, yes. or uh, also to try to improve uh, the performances of the thruster with uh, other propellants. No, uh, we, we are a lot investigating. Uh, Everybody is investi investigating the, um, the replacement of uh, xenon because of the cost, and only the cost. So xenon is a. Uh, has, quite a lot of advantages for electric propulsion in terms of performance, but uh, there is a big, big drawback is uh, the cost of this, uh, of this propellant. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> it's not a propellant which is mainly used for space. It was used for, uh, for, the, for the windows and for the lamps in the, um, uh, for the cars. Uh, but uh, so we are only uh, uh, small actors in, uh, in this, and we are not mastering at all um, the cost of the xenon. And we are, uh, so it's, it's something we, we don't, not, don't master, so we don't like it. And, uh, and the prices are quite uh, expensive. But it has implication to change propellants, also means to change of the. So changing the propellant has an impact on, uh, on the full chain. Uh, so first, uh, the, the thrusters have to, to perform uh, with equivalent performances. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, the performance is key, uh, you, you have seen it. Uh, but all the fluidic parts is, uh, has to be completely reviewed, and it's, it's also the, the way we, uh, we have uh, managed the fluidics uh, on the spacecraft, with uh, not, the, not the same volume, not the same pressure. Not, uh, okay. Uh, what kind of new uh, technologies in electric propulsion do you think will have the most impact on the commercial market? Uh, if I come back on um, uh, if we consider the um, commercial geostationary market, I think that it will take a few years before we, we introduce really new technologies. Where, where we see uh, new technology emerging, it's really with the constellation business. Because it's clearly here that uh, customers are really ready to take more risk on the where the new technology can, uh, can have a, a key advantage in terms of cost. Uh, so if we see um, new technology emerging in the coming years, it will start with the, the, low, the low, uh, constellation, low constellation uh, market. Uh, and even here, it will be quite difficult for the new technology because uh, we are developing constellation with the current technologies. And uh, so they are already starting to manufacture uh, in a sort of mass series uh, some thrusters. Uh, so they will have to, to be uh, mature enough to, uh, to be in advance for the price and for the industrialization of their product. So it's, uh, it's a market which will be difficult to enter, but, uh, but if they enter, it is uh, through this way. We'll do last one question. 
Uh, talking about constellations, uh, you talk about higher risk, uh, lower cost. We want to, to have a high cost reduction. This means that we are going to have uh, less reliable spacecraft, possibly. So this brings up the issue of uh, debris removal. Yeah. Is the debris removal question on the table, or is left for future consideration for uh, constellations? No. Um Oh, indeed, the reliability is not the same for the constellation because there is an overall uh, coverage, in fact, in terms of redundancy at the <laughs> constellation level. It means you, you are not uh, necessarily duplicating the thrusters, uh, having a redundant thrusters, because you, you have some additional spacecraft uh, very close that could do the mission in place of uh, the one who is uh, missing. Nevertheless, uh, no, we will not be able to let uh, spacecraft in orbit uh, like this. So we are working also on, uh, on um, platforms to remove the debris. And, uh, and it is part, uh, so yeah, for the OneWeb constellation, so, so OneWeb customers has uh, some developments to, to try to, uh, to have platform in the same time frame, uh, going and taking the, the spacecraft in case there is an issue. Mm -hmm. I also have one from my side, uh, Vincent, is uh, just, just to illustrate also the impacts of uh, electric propulsion. Uh, for a full electric, um, um, electric propulsion commercial satellite that has to go from a GTO to GEO um, 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 in three to six months, um, uh, which are the, also implication, the, the implications to, to, to wait that long, not only in the, in the question of time to market, Thank to revenue. Also, in the in, in the questions of uh, of uh, technology to protect the electric equipment from uh, from the radiation bells and and, and this thing. So this is an implication I would like. To um, so ra ra radiation issues are key. Huh? Uh, so we are when we are doing the transfer. So we we are very quick, but we are um, uh, going through the Van Allen belts. So we have some uh, critical radiation issues to tackle the, with that. Uh, so we, we have to uh, oversize uh, part of the equipment. The mass gains that we showed are counterbalancing these uh, drawbacks quite easily. Uh, so, so it's something that we have to, to, to understand correctly and to, to make it easy to manage at the platform levels. We, we have a solution and now that we have performed uh, already one transfer, we have already uh, uh, some uh, input from uh, from the in orbit uh, behavior, and uh, it's very uh, fruitful for our next uh, development. Um, the first part of the question. Uh, it's <coughs> just my question was um, which which is the impact on yeah. on on shield in the, yes. the, the equipment and mm. and if if this is an issue or it yeah. is just uh, so, so uh, on the shielding itself of the equipment, it's something that we is. Uh, Main, main equipments are really inside the, the spacecraft, so 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 we are quite well protected. And uh, and in fact, the the, the difference between uh, uh, because when you are in uh, just a geostationary platform uh, orbit during 15 years, you have a lot of radiation also. So the additional radiation is not so big, and uh, so we we have to take care a little bit more, but not so much. Uh, it's more uh, the solar rays, which are uh, which could be uh, an issue uh, for for that. I have a question. Uh, can, can you comment about the, the use, the hybrid use of uh, the different electric propulsion systems in a platform, ion engines hold all together doing the best thing? Um, so I think you are speak, thinking about the Boeing configuration. Uh, so Boeing uh, has developed uh, a platform. Uh, uh, yes, I, I could, uh, no. Okay. It's a similar platform to perform um, all electric transfer. What, what they are doing uh, is using all effect thrusters for the transfer, and then having uh, gridded thrusters for uh, station keeping. If we take the technical uh, aspect, it is clearly the optimized uh, configuration. You are using thrust during transfer, so you can do a lot of delta velocity um, correction with uh, electric propulsion. So it's the best technology. And when you are on station, here you have no more um, trust constraints, so the highest, the ISP, the best it is for, uh, for the subsystem. So if you look at the technical point of view, there is no, uh, uh, no issue, it is the best uh, solution. If you take uh, the 
technical and the economical point of view, it's quite different because here they have to buy two different subsystems. And unfortunately, today, uh, the electric propulsion subsystem are very expensive and um, clearly too, too much expensive. So as long as the electric propulsion would have a such cost, uh, the gain uh, in terms of uh, xenon that they don't use for station keeping will never be uh, counterbalanced by the additional cost. So I'm very <coughs> happy to see uh, Boeing doing that because for me, uh, they are out of the competition for that. They, they will bring some costs. So they have a beautiful product and Boeing has always, always have beautiful product, but uh, if you look at the economical matters, I think uh, it's not the, the best solution. Okay, no more questions from the table. Any questions from the audience? <laughs> Okay, last you. Yeah. Last question, and then I think we need we need a break and a coffee. Regarding the the trend that you showed on mass gains, is it only for orbit raising, or yeah. what about the trends from, for example, deep space exploration and main propulsion? No. It's for orbit raising. Uh, we we have to be very careful when when showing such curves. Uh, it's uh, such curves are boundary limits. We are already speaking about uh, transfer to geostationary uh, orbit. Uh, what I can say is that if you have time constraints, you will have similar curves for exploration. If you say, the, uh, if you say I need to be on Mars in a, in a half a year, or one year, because half a year it would be difficult, uh, in one year, there is um, good probability that you will have similar trade-offs and when you, f you freeze the, the duration, uh, the trust is also important and sometimes more important than the ISP. Uh, if you have time, and it was the case for most of the exploration uh, platforms up to now, uh, here you will look for ISP. And you will try to reduce the mass of, uh, of xenon or, or the propellant you are using. So be careful, here it's really, uh, a trade-off in a given configuration. It is, so it is the main uh, configuration for use of electric propulsion today, but uh, tomorrow it could change. There could be also parameters who could change. Uh, today we are using platform up to uh, 20, 25 kilowatts. Uh, if tomorrow we have platform and geostationary orbit with uh, 100 kilowatts, uh, perhaps it will not be uh, so dramatic to do the transfer in uh, two months in place of one month. <coughs> So here, perhaps, you will look for a bigger ISP. So uh, all trade-offs are contextual. And uh, so this one is done, and I, I think it will last for at least uh, the 10 coming years. But uh, we have to be careful. And it is very the role of the primes to be always uh, careful on that and to, 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 to see what, what could be the evolution on, uh, on the market. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, Vincent, again.